Is there a place in time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an indefinable line between the reasonable and the highly unlikely? Makeshift Stories presents a monthly journey into the improbable. Today's story, episode 217, The Experiologist, New Obsession. Read and recorded by Mitchell Two. Opening and closing theme by Matthew Erdman. Somewhere and sometime, a memory might become addictive. I have been an insect, a virus riding on the back of an interstellar dust particle, a biped, a quadruped, a multiped, and a photon trapped in the infinite present at the speed of light. However, none of that prepared me for the impact of the recent additions to my collection. It started unexpectedly, after I had moved through too many worlds to remember and too many experiences to count. It started with an unexpected encounter with what, on the surface, appeared to be one of the seven billion inhabitants of this insignificant myopic world. A human, calling itself Agent Samard, who was in fact alien. Forced into a corner, I had to protect myself. However, I am a connoisseur, and generally extremely selective of the experiences I incorporate into my being. But this time I could not afford to be so scrupulous, and the influx of its unfiltered life overwhelmed me. I was shocked by the hatred, vitriol, and misunderstanding I unintendedly ingested. I am, like all of my kind, only a reflection of the experiences I've collected, and now this is a part of me, and I have become something new, something I don't like. I finally caught you! It proclaimed triumphantly after forcing its way into my new office. You ruined our world. Get out, I demanded. You have no business with me. Although, from the accusation, I suspected it did. You're a genocidal criminal, it accused venomously. I know that's what you believe. Nevertheless, I've done nothing but harvest select experiences. I tried to point out, dropping my pretense at ignorance. I have never intentionally ruined anything. No one missed those ideas. We both know they could have disappeared into obscurity, or more likely resurfaced in another. So I have taken nothing from you. They didn't reappear, it spat accusingly, then started to pull something from its pocket. Intentionally or not, you stole our future. You had no right to take that knowledge. Without it, a pandemic all but wiped us out. You, you took the novel science needed for the cure, for your personal collection, and we paid the ultimate price for your greed. I have previously claimed I cannot remove an experience without the owner's permission. But in truth, that is more a statement of principle than fact. I chose not to, but have the ability to take what I need, and when cornered, I take what I must. I dove into Agent Samard's mind and saw myself in my many forms through its eyes and discovered a monster before I sunk helplessly into its hateful memories. Stop! It and I yelled as we hurled through a narrow passage lined with brightly colored conduits. The ground seemed to suddenly shift under our feet and we put out an arm in a futile attempt to keep from crashing into the wall. Pain stabbed into our head as we bashed into a low-hanging pipe. Momentarily dazed, we placed a hand on our forehead and felt sticky warm blood, shook off the sting of injury, then started off again, this time prepared for another change in direction. We are on a ship, I guess, but where? We hear a thud and a curse somewhere ahead as the floor momentarily falls away and the ceiling descends. A storm at sea, I wonder. But Samard's experience doesn't provide such detail. It is solely focused on its prey, another like me. It's a dead end. You have nowhere to go. 
we warn the thing ahead, then sprint to catch up while it's still recovering. Rounding a corner, we see the legs of a tall, lanky being lying prone on the rough metal grate. This is not an ocean-going vessel, I finally realize. We are in space. The back of its scale-covered head is matted with blood. It's a form I've been before, long ago, when I first emerged, and the creature's fear is intoxicating, making both of us high on its surging adrenaline. All I'm going to do is take back what is rightfully ours, we growl. But you can't, it protested. I, I can't be dissected. I am the sum of the experiences I have harvested. Take them away and I I I'm nothing. We eagerly consume its fear as the creature continues to plead and we pull a small object from our pocket. Seeing the device, the experiologist tries to jump up in the confined space, but hits its head on another pipe, knocking it back to the floor. With the agility of a jaguar, we spring, slamming the device onto its chest. Our prey tries desperately to rip the thing off, but it refuses to budge. The experiologist sinks to the metal deck, then collapses. Stunned and horrified, I pull away from the experience. Samard was a tracer, an apex predator, unleashed by a world which blames us for their fate. Once on the scent, a tracer never gives up, and I was facing one standing just a few feet away. Okay, I replied, trying to sound resigned to my fate and keep my presence in his mind hidden for the moment. He pulled the small object we had just inflicted on the experiologist from his memories out of his pocket, a thing I had hoped to never come across again. Simard placed the menacing thing on the table and smiled at me like a cat about to play with a mouse. An extractor, he explained needlessly. It's a crude device, but the best we could come up with. I'm only after one experience, one set of memories you stole. Unfortunately, the extractor will take everything, Simard admitted with a feral smile. I'm not a thief, I protested, playing for the time I needed to prepare. I paid for everything I've collected. Simard just stared at me and slowly shook his head. And you think that compensates for the damage you've done? How many other world's futures have you consumed? Well, it ends here. He began to move his hand over the extractor, and that's when I was compelled to take all his experiences, as many as I could. Six months of the tracer's life rushed in like a tsunami, and I struggled to remain at least partially who I am. Several times I almost drowned in him. He arrived, like me, as a series of thoughts looking for a home. Found a down-and-out human, gave them purpose, then directed them to hunt me down. At first, I was shocked. I hadn't been aware of being pursued. I hadn't been aware that anyone suspected we even exist. I was shocked to discover the tracers had hunted us like an unwanted invasive weed. Even more, I was shocked to discover we both might be the last of our kinds. With my mind feeling like a stomach force-fed kitchen scraps, I waited until everyone had left the building, then carried Agent Samard to the lobby and left him there in a pile of limbs and badly fitting clothes. He would recover. He would eventually remember why he had come to this world. But the gap left by what I had taken would give me time to disappear into the planet's large population. What indiscriminately ingesting six months of a tracer's life would do, I had no idea, but I could already sense a change in my tastes and desires. Lauren, may I call you Lauren? Thank you for coming to see me. I'm confident I can help. I smiled at the distraught-looking professional woman sitting across the desk from me. A quick online search before she arrived had told me she was potentially an ideal client. A rising entrepreneur, influencer, and online travel host star involved in a recent tragic tropical waterfall accident. 
I, I've tried everything else, she explained. You're my last hope, doctor. I had taken on this new form, more as a matter of luck, having met the good doctor on a plane. She was in the seat next to me and proved to be quite friendly. I immediately saw the advantage of her vocation, a psychologist, a career where people came to you. No need for ads anymore. I had learned from Agent Samard that the ads led him to me, and I wasn't going to make that mistake again, especially with the presence of a tracer on this planet. I only took the experience of our conversation and one other thing, so she thought she had been asleep during the flight. She smiled politely at me as she got up to disembark at my stop, minus her ID and memory of who she was. I used the stopover to transform, then, exhausted by the process, returned to her seat on the plane and the conference she had been en route to attend. I can take those nightmares away, Lauren, and rid your mind of the ghosts haunting you. But the treatment is not cheap. I had found that charging large amounts for my services provided me with a satisfying flow of affluent patients with desirable experiences. A bittersweet irony, given how much I had paid in the past as Mr. Hughes for similar quality material. Thank you, doctor. But I must ask, is this some form of hypnotism? Is there any chance the memory will come back? No. I can assure you this is not a hypnotic suggestion, and there is no way for a removed experience to return. If you are concerned, you can ask any of my former patients. Now, are you ready to proceed? What should I do? She asked, still not convinced I could erase her troubling experience. Just focus on the memory that triggers your anxiety. Lauren closed her eyes, and I could feel the fear flow into the air around her, like static electricity. I drifted through its web, looking for its source, and found what I was hoping would be there. Lauren! Our name was barely audible over the roar of the water. We looked over the edge, following the all-too-thin-looking ropes, leading down to a young man or woman, it was hard to tell, in a harness, suspended halfway down. Hanging just to one side of a waterfall, they were waving up at us. This is great, Lauren, you have to try it, they yelled encouragingly. We wave back, feigning enthusiasm. Then I am abruptly bathed in anticipation, jealousy, and fear with a hint of anger. Oh, glorious fear, it tastes so divine. I can feel it grow in the base of our spine and make its way upward releasing adrenaline and increasing our blood pressure and heart rate. It overtakes us, and I revel in its purity. It feeds my hunger without sating it, leaving me wanting more. For this reason, I had avoided fear until it was forced into my lexicon when I ingested Samard's unfiltered experiences. Then, obsessed with it, added more from the doctor. The memory shifts unexpectedly and we are looking at a broken body on the rocks a hundred meters below. Fear, anxiety, joy, and guilt fight for dominance with no one winning. This is the memory my client wants removed. I will take it, but I sense something else pulling at me, like a moth to a flame. Lauren is trying to hide it, but there is no way she can. I feel her fight my intrusion, and I feed on her rising fear. However, the pitiful wall she had built around this open wound finally breaks, and we are again at the top of the waterfall. This time, we back away from the cliff, as unexplained anger sweeps away rational thought. Suddenly, we are attacking the climbing ropes, cutting them loose from their anchor. We hear a scream beyond the cliff edge, and I soak it all in, wanting more.
Makeshift Stories is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. To get other great APN podcasts, head over to albertapodcastnetwork.com and take a listen to Cross Pollination and join NB as they interview people who combine fields, knowledge, and talents to create something new. This episode of Makeshift Stories is brought to you by ATB. At ATB, we make banking work for you. With expert and practical advice in everyday banking and investment planning expertise and management service with ATB Wealth, you can be confident that you're making smart choices when it comes to your money. We have a history of doing what's right for our clients, especially when times are tough, because ATB was built to help Albertans. For more information, visit atb.com. This episode of Makeshift Stories is also brought to you by Park Power. In Alberta, you get to choose who to buy your internet, electricity, and natural gas from. If you switch providers, nothing changes about the delivery of these utilities to your home or business. If you have an existing contract, you're going to want to find out the terms before leaving. If you don't, then it's even easier to sign up for Park Power. You as the consumer have the choice of who you pay your bills to. Why not choose your friendly local utilities provider? Learn more at parkpower.ca. Makeshift Stories is released twice a month around the 1st and the 15th. This month's story was written by Alan V. Hare and read by Mitchell Two. Post-production by Matthew Erdman. Opening and closing themes were composed and recorded by Matthew Erdman. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Links to both are in the show notes. You can help us out by getting your friends to subscribe or follow wherever they listen to audio. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories. Just remember to credit us and don't alter anything. <laughs>